Notre Dame's first couple of spring practices are in the books, and the offense is already starting to take shape. We've got plenty of news coming out of South Bend to discuss, but I'm going to tell you why Chris Tyree's move to wide receiver is the most important storyline so far. That's all coming up on this edition of Locked On Irish. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Irish. It is Monday, March 27th, and thank you for getting your week started here and making this your first listen of the day. As always, this show is available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. If you're watching the show on YouTube, please throw the video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And if you're listening to the podcast, please rate the show five stars, leave a review, and subscribe to the channel. I know it seems minor, but you'd be surprised uh, by how much that helps in the growth of the show, and I really appreciate it. My name is Tyler Wojcik, and I'm the host. I've been a huge Notre Dame fan for my entire life. I graduated from the university in 2018, and I've been podcasting about the football team for the past three years. I'm also a producer for the college football talent at the Fox Sports headquarters in LA, and there's a lot we need to get to in this episode. Um, It was a busy weekend on campus as the Irish kicked off spring practice last Wednesday and had another... Uh, had another practice open to the media on Saturday. Uh, we'll open for the first five periods, I should say. Uh, so I'm going to share some of my takeaways from the early portion of the spring session. There are also a lot of top recruits visiting over the weekend, including five-star defensive tackle Justin Scott, which we'll talk about more later in the week. Uh, Micah Shrewsbury, the new men's basketball coach, was also in attendance for the practice. And if you haven't heard my interview with Mark Titus from Barstool Sports about the hire uh, that we did last week, uh, you should d- definitely go check that out now. Mark was great and had a ton of really positive things to say about Shrewsbury, and it made me really excited about the future of the program, and I think you'll feel the same way. Notre Dame also hosted its pro day for their NFL draft hopefuls on Friday, which I'll touch on at the end. We also got a couple housekeeping items from spring practice that I'll get to in the second segment, but I want to start with Chris Tyree and his move to wide receiver because I think it's the biggest storyline coming out of spring practice so far. So on Wednesday, the media was in attendance, and I was not one of those people, but the media who were in attendance got to see the first five periods of the practice. Most of that is stretching, individual drills. And most of the people are just trying to figure out, you know, who's there, who's not, who's lining up where, all that. But Chris Tyree was working with the wide receivers during those first five periods. And when Marcus Freeman was asked about it afterwards, he said it wasn't a permanent move, but Tyree's a guy they need to have on the field. And I totally agree. Notre Dame's running back room is so loaded that Tyree's skill set has become underrated, in my opinion. We know he's incredibly fast in the open field and has breakaway speed that there's only a few guys, if any, on the roster have that are better than Tyree. He's twitchy, he's elusive around defenders, and he's got solid hands and runs pretty effective routes for a running back. Um, Last year, he was third on the team in rushing yards with 444 yards on 100 carries. That was third on the team behind Estime and Diggs, but his 4.4 yards per carry is really solid for a third leading rusher. He was also fourth on the team in catches in 2022 as he held in 24 passes for 138 yards and two touchdowns. He had 149 receiving yards after the catch, but because he got tackled behind the line of scrimmage on some of those plays, um, his net receiving yards are a little bit number. Or his net receiving yards is a little bit lower. To be honest, I actually expected those receiving numbers to be higher going into last season, coming off that really impressive performance he had in the Fiesta Bowl when he had six catches for 115 yards and a touchdown against Oklahoma State. Now. Part of that dip might have to do with the QB situation Notre Dame dealt with all of last year, but it's clear he has the ability to be an effective wide receiver. Um, according to PFF, Tyree only had one drop last season, and I'll admit it was a big one. Uh, if you remember, he dropped that screen pass against BYU. I think it was kind of early in the game, but it probably would have been a touchdown if he had caught it because he was so wide open. He had blockers in front of him and just a ton of room to run. But I'm not going to say he has bad hands because he had one drop, although it was it was big in the moment. So we have enough evidence that Tyree has enough of a foundation to be a productive receiver out of the slot. And I also think this move makes sense given the depth or how deep the running back room is. Logan Diggs and Audrey Kestemay are the clear one-two punch. And of the two... Estime looks like he might have an absolutely huge year this year. He looks a little bit slimmer in the clips I've seen so far in the pictures. He probably cut down on some of the body weight, but he's still a a tank. Like, And he's still going to crush defensive backs in the open field to try to tackle him. But he just looks a little bit more mobile now, and that's a scary thing for opposing defenses to have to think about. But if Tyree's not going to get as many touches out of the as a true running back, how else can Notre Dame utilize him? 
Well, if he's lined up in the slot, he can be used in jet sweeps, screens, and short crossing routes that allows him to take advantage of his acceleration in the open field and could create some mismatches with opposing uh, linebackers or even you know defensive ends who are out like split out on him. And according to the roster given out to the media, it looks like Tyree has slimmed down a bit, which probably makes sense given this move because he doesn't have to be as bulky. Like he's not getting hit by as many D linemen and inside linebackers if he's going to be working out of the slot. And like a lot of you guys, I I got frustrated sometimes when I'd see Tyree get the ball inside the tackles last season. His build just isn't suited for that. I think he's five nine and a half. He was listed around two hundred pounds, but he just kind of short legs. It didn't really make sense when you've got Logan Diggs and Audrey Estime to give the ball to. But when I looked at the numbers numbers today. Um, he was actually more productive inside the tackles than you might think. So according to PFF, and look, I know people have their gripes about PFF grades. Like I certainly am one of those people, but PFF does provide a lot of interesting stats that I think are, well, they're not subjective. And I think they're really helpful to look at. So if you look at the numbers here, Tyree had 37 carries out of 95 true rushing attempts last season in between the tackles. Five of those carries, because earlier I said he had 100, those were passes behind the line of scrimmage that he caught and then immediately got tackled. So technically they count as rushes, but 95 true rushing attempts. So those 37 carries between the tackles amounted to 159 rushing yards, which averages out to about 4.3 yards per carry, which is actually not bad. To be honest, I, that number was a lot higher than I was expecting. But when you compare that to Logan Diggs, who carried the ball between the tackles 67 times for 353 yards, which is 5.3 yards per carry, and Audrick Estime, who had 78 rushes for 463 yards between the tackles, which is 5.9 yards per carry, that's it just becomes a no-brainer. So if you're looking at the three of them, when they get the ball inside the tackles, Estime averages 5.9 yards per carry, Diggs averages 5.3, and Kyrus Tyree is a full yard short of that number at 4.3. So look, when you look at that, it's clear. Chris Tyree, Chris Tyree should never run inside, and that's not even considering what Jadarian Price could provide this season for the running backs. Price obviously missed all of last season with the torn Achilles, and he's still not full go in spring ball. Uh, but the hope is that he will be by fall camp. And that's another guy who's probably more suited to carrying the ball inside than Chris Tyree. So if it's clear that Chris shouldn't run inside, that doesn't mean there isn't a spot for him on the offense. Because if you look at the last three seasons, Tyree has eight rushing touchdowns, four receiving, and the famous kickoff return for a touchdown against Wisconsin back in 2021, which completely changed the course of that game and arguably the course of the entire season. Because if Notre Dame loses that game, you know how different is that 2020 season? one season um, it was just a huge play and it just flashed that incredible speed that he has and if you look at it that's 13 touchdowns in total that's more touchdowns of the course of their career than anyone else in the Notre Dame roster at this point and that just can't be ignored Jared Parker was asked over the weekend about the identity of his offense and he said it's going to be about leaning into the strengths of Notre Dame offensive football and that means getting the best playmakers the ball and the spots in the field in which they're the most comfortable. And even though Tyree is not the best true running back on the roster, or even the second best, he's still one of the best playmakers on the Notre Dame offense. And moving him to wide receiver is going to allow him the opportunity to showcase that more this season. Okay, coming up next, who's in and who's out on the Notre Dame roster? Before we get to that, though, I've got to tell you about Built Bar. The Built March Madness bracket is here, and we know you have a favorite bar, Puff, and now's your time to make it count. Go to BuiltMarchMadness.com to vote for your favorites. You know I'll be voting for the Brownie Batter Puff Bar, and if you want your team to win, then you'll be voting for that bar, too. Support your team, support your favorite bar or Puff, and when you vote for your favorite bar, Puff, you'll be entered into a drawing where 50 lucky Locked On listeners will get a free box of Built. Not only that, but one Locked On fan will win a 12-month subscription to Built to have Built's best bars or Puffs to delivered monthly straight to your door. You got to try Built. It's the best protein bar ever. Seriously, they're so amazing, you won't even think they're good for you. And what makes them so great? Well, for starters, they're all high in protein, low in sugar, and covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. So run to BuiltMarchMadness.com right now to vote for your favorite bar, Puff, and pick up a box while you're there. You can vote every day in March. So hop in and support your pick today. All right, thanks again for making this your first listen of the day. Be sure to subscribe to the show if you haven't already and tune in later this week for more updates on Notre Dame spring practice. Uh, we've got plenty of news so far about the state of the Notre Dame roster during the first couple of practices. So quarterback Ron Paulus III, safety Justin Walters, and linebacker Will Schwitzer have each medically retired from football. Um, that's a bummer for those guys, but it is my understanding that they will be able to maintain their scholarship and get their degree from Notre Dame. Cornerback Philip Riley, kicker Josh Bryan, and offensive lineman Caleb Johnson are no longer with the program. Uh, Marcus Freeman didn't really elaborate too much on their status, but if I had to guess, they were probably told after the 2022 season that they likely weren't part of the team's plans on the field going forward and will have to transfer out if they want to continue playing college football. 
After these departures, the Notre scholarship count went from 93 to 87, just two away from the 85-man limit. And we're probably going to see more guys at the bottom of the depth chart leave after spring practice. So I'm not worried at all about getting that number to 85. And I know that some people were upset that Notre Dame basically, they, if they think that they kicked off these players who are no longer with the program, I just I don't really think that's the case, honestly. I think people are making too big of a deal out of that. But some injury news we got. Defensive back Chris – or excuse me. Some injury news, uh, defensive backs Cam Hart and Thomas Harper are both in non-contact during spring practice. They're both coming off shoulder surgeries from late in the year, and they're still participating in the practice, but obviously we won't see too much action from them until the fall. And look, shoulder injuries are such a pain, and they can really linger. I mean, I think Hart's dealing with his third one already. Harper's got a history with that too. So I just hope for both of these guys that they're able to recover fully and play a full season in 2022 because Notre Dame really needs both of them at the back end of their defense. As I mentioned earlier, Jadarian Price is limited during spring while he recovers from his torn Achilles, but hopefully he'll get more action as the weeks go by. He had a big touchdown in last year's spring game. I don't know if we're going to see him in this year's spring game, but any reps we get with him out there uh, is good for the Notre Dame offense. Tight ends Kevin Bauman and Eli Raritan are both out for spring practice as they recover from knee injuries. And I know some people are a little bit concerned about the depth of the tight end room right now with those guys out for the spring. Personally, I'm not too worried yet. They've still got Mitchell Evans and Holden Stays, and I think Mitchell Evans is going to have an awesome year this year. And that's a really good one-two punch until the other guys get healthy. If another injury pops up that's severe and might uh, take a guy out for a while, I might change my stance on this. But for now, I'm not really worried about the tight end room. It seems crazy to ever be worried about tight end you. Uh, fr- freshman defensive lineman Devin Houston is out with a shoulder injury, which is unfortunate because he's the only freshman D lineman to early enroll, and that's a position where Notre Dame could really use a freshman to step up. And for Devin, that just really sucks because he finished high school early to enroll uh, and try to get a leg up on the rest of the freshmen and only to have to sit out for all of spring practice dealing with this injury. So that's got to be a really tough time for him. So I'm wishing him the best. Like I was thinking about my own experience when I left for college for the first time. That first semester, man, it was rough. Now, granted, I was at Holy Cross trying to transfer into Notre Dame, but anyone who's had to move away for college knows that those first couple months when you're away from home, like you're getting homesick, you miss your friends, you miss your family, that's a really tough time. Then you consider the fact that you're in South Bend during the winter, which is not great. It's not like you have football games to look forward to either. So it's tough for any early enrollee freshman, especially one who isn't able to get out in the field. So I feel for him. I also feel for uh, Adon Schuler. He's another freshman who's recovering from shoulder, sur- from shoulder surgery and will be out for the duration of spring practice. Um, that had been reported before spring practice, so this isn't like breaking news, but it's still an unfortunate situation. Marcus Freeman did say after the first practice that they're going to look into the transfer portal when it open, opens up again on May 1st to see if they can add a grad transfer safety. I think this makes a ton of sense given the lack of depth in that room right now and also that lack of a bona fide stud. It would have been really nice to have Peyton Bowen in there, but that's not how it worked out. In an ideal world, Notre Dame would be able to pick up another Nick McLeod, but at safety as opposed to cornerback. Um, if you remember, Notre Dame didn't pick up McLeod until pretty late in the process, but with how the transfer portal works these days, it seems like the, a lot of the guys who are good players who want to get out early, they leave as soon as the season is over, but maybe Notre Dame can uh, get some luck here, get a good guy in the portal that could help them out at safety. Uh, my hunch is that Notre Dame will probably just pick up a rotation guy, just have more guys in that room, but not a surefire starter, as was the case with Nick McLeod. We also got some news regarding the coaching staff. Running backs coach Dylan McCullough was promoted to run game coordinator and Mike Mickens will be the defensive pass game coordinator. Personally, like I don't really put too much stock into the actual titles, but I think this has more to do with them getting a well-deserved pay raise. Marcus Freeman even said that all 10 of his uh, assistant coaches from last year's staff were approached by other college and NFL teams over the offseason. That's not really a surprise based on, based on a lot of what we've heard so far. But, you know, it's a great way to keep a coach around. You just pay him more. And these titles probably allow for that to happen. Um, one final housekeeping note here. We got some more clarity on the Brandon Hillman situation. Uh, obviously, Hillman was granted his release from his national letter of intent about a month ago. And then he committed to Michigan not long after. Austin Meek from The Athletic did a really good story on Hillman's decision. And credit to Brandon Hillman. He just came out and said, hey, Notre Dame admissions had standards and I didn't meet it. That was that. And I know that some people have speculated that it has to do with Notre Dame's foreign language requirement for people coming out of high school going into the university. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't want to speculate, really. But even if you don't agree with that requirement, I get it. Like, I trust me, I did not want to take a foreign language in high school, but I did to try to get into Notre Dame. If Notre Dame had told Hillman he's got to take one and he chose not to, then he just wasn't that committed to Notre Dame, clearly, and like it's unfortunate, but if he's not willing to do what's asked of him and what was necessary to get in, 
like, and that isn't even that big of an ask from Notre Dame, then he probably wouldn't last that long at the school because he just clearly wasn't bought all the way in, so it's unfortunate. But at least now we have a little bit more clarity on what exactly went down there. Okay, coming up next, we'll wrap up today's show with some shout-outs and close-outs from the weekend, including a huge couple of wins for the Fighting Irish men's baseball team over one of the best teams in the entire country. But before we get to that, I want to tell you about FanDuel. The tournament is heating up, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to points scored and threes made. Huge game in the NBA tonight as the 76ers head to Denver to take on the Nuggets. This game will have huge implications in the MVP race, and I believe Joel Embiid is going to come out and try and dominate from the start. He almost always does when he's going up against Jokic, and I'm going to do a same game parlay all in Embiid and the Sixers, so giving the 76ers to cover plus five, and I'll take the over on Embiid's points and rebounds going up against Nikola Jokic, and I really like Nikola Jokic, by the way. I just think Embiid is very determined to win this MVP, and he's going to try to win it tonight. FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay, like the one I just mentioned. So don't miss a chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, let's wrap up the show with some shout-outs and closeouts from the weekend. Shout-out to the Notre Dame fencing team who completed a national title three-peat over the weekend. It's the 13th title overall, and they're fifth of the last seven seasons. Many people are wondering if the uh, Notre Dame fencing is the greatest dynasty in sports right now, and I would have to say yes. We're fencing school, man. It's awesome. Now for a bit of bad news. The Notre Dame women's basketball season came to an unfortunate end over the weekend as the Irish fell to the Maryland Terrapins, 76-59. to I want to give a big shout-out to Coach Neil Ivey and her team, though. They were incredibly resilient all season long, but especially after they lost two of their top players in Dara Mabry and Olivia Miles. It's a bummer that this season ended the way it did, but it's still very impressive that they were able to make it to the Sweet 16, all things considered. Um, okay, now good news. Shout-out to the men's baseball team. For their series win of the Louisville Cardinals, the Irish got the win on Friday and Saturday before dropping the series finale on Sunday. And if you're not a huge fan of college baseball, Louisville is consistently one of the top programs in the entire country, and this year is no different. Back when I used to live in Louisville, I used to go to a, a decent amount of Louisville baseball games because uh, they sold alcohol, and it was a good time, and they were a really good team to watch. Um, and yeah, they have a great coach, great team year in, year out. They're consistently putting guys in the pros. And Notre Dame came up with a big series win over them this weekend. Uh, the Irish have won four out of their last five now. So they're starting to pick it up a bit after a slow start to the season. Shout out to them. Um, we got a great moment from this past weekend as the Notre Dame football team made their way over to our lot of family stadium to check out the number one ranked Notre Dame men's lacrosse team take on the Virginia Cavaliers after they finish after the football team finished up with practice. So Chris Cavanaugh scored a goal on a sweet play to tie the game at seven, and the football players went absolutely nuts on the hill. The cameras were all over it. If you haven't seen the video, you should absolutely go check it out. Um, I was loving Now, unfortunately, the men's across team fell to Virginia, but they're going to be fine. They're a loaded team. They're going to get back soon. They could definitely win a national championship this season. But seeing that video and seeing that kind of support, like that's just one of the best things about college sports, in my opinion, and particularly at Notre Dame. Like, even though college football sometimes feels like minor league football, it's really cool whenever you get to see these guys act like normal students, and especially when they're supporting their fellow student athletes. Like, I just don't think you see that as much at other schools because the players aren't as integrated in the rest of the campus community like they are at Notre Dame. Like, I remember when Joe Burrow had his senior day and he was going to talk to the students, he basically was like, yeah, I never really see these guys. Like, I never see the student body because I'm taking all online classes. I'm hanging out with the football team all the time. Justin Fields, same deal. So Notre Dame is different. For better or worse, sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. Uh, I thought this was a really cool moment, though, and I think everyone listening, if you haven't, go, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, go check it out. It was really cool, and uh, hopefully the Notre Dame men's lacrosse team will get back on track soon. All right, last one. Shout out to the 13 former Notre Dame football players who participated in the Pro Day on Friday. There were dozens of scouts in attendance, and based on what I've read, it sounds like all 13 guys performed pretty well. A couple standouts I want to highlight. Defensive tackle Chris Smith benched 225 pounds 37 times, which would have put him at second in the NFL Combine. So I was blown away by that number. I actually put it put that info in, into one of those online calculators you can do where you basically try to find out what is your likely one rep max based on how many reps you do with a certain weight. And according to one of the sites, Christmas numbers equal out to a 505-pound one rep max on bench. Now, look, these calculators aren't perfect, but they do give you a general idea of what you can do. 
uh, if you put in like your height, weight, age, all that. And 505 pounds on bench is simply an insane amount of weight to throw around. So credit to Chris Smith. Bo Bauer also put up some really impressive numbers. He benched 225 30 times, which should have been the most of any linebacker at the NFL Combine, I'm pretty sure. I don't know if that's just like a result of him doing a ton of upper body workouts while he rehabs his knee. But either way, that's really just incredible stuff right by him. I'm rooting for him, man. He's a great Notre Dame guy, and I hope he's able to find a place at the next level where he can contribute on special teams. I don't really think he has the size or the ability to play linebacker in the NFL, but he could definitely make his, uh, make an impression for a team on special teams. You saw how good he was at Notre Dame um, in that part of the game. And he even took some reps as a uh, as long sapper at Pro Day, which, again, makes sense given his affinity for special teams. I will be talking more about Notre Dame's NFL draft prospects as we get closer to the draft. My hope is to have some NFL draft experts on as well uh, to talk more about that. So be sure to stay tuned for that later on. But that's going to do it for me today. Thanks again for making this your first listen of the day. On the way out, remember to subscribe to the show on YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts, and give us a follow on Twitter at Lockdown Irish, on Instagram at Lockdown Irish Pod, and my personal Twitter account at Tyler Wojcik. That's at Tyler W O J C I A K. For your second listen, check out our brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball, where experts Isaac Shea and Andy Patton bring you everything you need to know on and off the court. Plus, you're from big name experts, coaches, and players throughout the basketball landscape. That's Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Same time, same place tomorrow, guys. I'll see you.